July 1 edition of PFTOT, otherwise known as Bobby Bonilla Day, and that is the only reference in this space to Bobby Bonilla and his $1.2 million that he gets this year and every year through 2035. Good gig if you can get it. Good gig if you can get it is to be the disciplinary officer for the National Football League. Judge Sue L. Robinson sat and waited for two years. Presumably they paid her to be on retainer to sit and wait. She finally had some work to do, and she did it this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the disciplinary hearing for Browns quarterback Deshaun Watson. She has taken the matter under advisement. Briefs are due on July the 11th. My guess would be, and this is just a guess based upon practicing law for almost 20 years, July 25-ish, sometime that week, we'll get a decision. She will receive written materials from both sides. She will put together a written opinion. It will be over under 19 and a half pages, and I'd probably take the over. I think it'll at least be 20 pages. Maybe I should have said over under 20.5, 21.5. I think it will be north of 20 because there's going to be two key ingredients to the final decision. One, her findings of fact, because those findings of fact are binding on Commissioner Roger Goodell if he decides or if he is requested to handle an appeal of her decision. Remember, either side can pursue an appeal unless there's no discipline issued at all. At that point, it's over. Any discipline imposed, Sean Watson can appeal and ask for less. The league can appeal and ask for more. Both could happen. Both could be sufficiently unhappy with the outcome that one side wants less and the other side wants more. But her findings of fact are binding on the appeal process. So how she explains what the facts are based upon the evidence that was presented. More on that in a second. The other key part of her ruling obviously will be the ruling, the decision, how she takes those facts and applies the law to them. That's always important in any legal setting. And here the law is the personal conduct policy. What is prohibited under the personal conduct policy as reflected by how the conduct policy has been applied in the past, whether it is a finding of evidence of some form of sexual assault or whether she decides that there's been a violation of the general catch-all prohibition on any conduct that undermines the integrity of the NFL, the league, or any of its member teams. That is a very broad prohibition that possibly applies to Deshaun Watson. So she determines the facts, then she applies the personal conduct policy to the facts, and she reaches a decision. Now, there's definitely some optimism that things went well for Deshaun Watson, in large part because, and as we reported last night, the NFL's presentation of evidence, they interviewed a dozen of the women who have made accusations against Deshaun Watson, obviously sexual misconduct during massage therapy sessions. For those of you just new to the story, it's been around for about 15 and a half months now. Spoke to 12 of the women, focused on five of the cases. My understanding is, and this comes from a person with knowledge of the proceedings, no evidence of any violence committed, no evidence of any threats of violence, no evidence of any coercion, no evidence of any duress, no evidence that would constitute assault or battery or anything that would trigger that six game baseline suspension. There's a six game baseline suspension that was one of the products of the Ray Rice situation where the NFL beefed up the personal conduct policy and created that six game suspension as the not, not minimum, but baseline. It can go down, it can go up based upon mitigating or aggravating factors, but it's a baseline of six. If you don't have any evidence of any assault, any violence, anything that would fall under that category, the six game minimum suspension doesn't apply as to any of the individuals, none of them. You've got five different cases that were brought to Judge Robinson. If you have no evidence of assault in any of them, you don't have a six game baseline suspension for any of them. So, and I'm approaching this very logically. That's what happens. You've got the allegations that are made. You've got the court of public opinion that reacts. But then at some point, somebody wearing a black robe has to decide 
what is, is the law and what are the facts and how do they intersect? And if you don't have evidence of actual assault, if you can't prove, and the NFL's got the burden here, if you can't prove that an assault happened, you go 0 for 5 in your effort to get to the baseline six-game suspension. You don't even get close to a year. See, there had been a loose sense, and I fault Deshaun Watson's camp for not effectively creating the narrative and pushing back and explaining to reporters and providing smoking gun evidence that helps show that some of these cases may not be very strong. This is on them. When Tony Busby was scoring body blow after body blow in the court of public opinion, and Watson's camp wasn't doing anything other than saying, oh, there's no crime in seeking a happy ending. I mean, you need something better than that to convince people. Folks were looking at it saying, hey, there's 24 claims against the guy, soon to be 26. Must have done something wrong. 24? Hey, Ben Roethlisberger got four games for two claims. Hmm, 24 claims must have 48 games coming. That was what people thought. And Watson's camp never did anything to fill in that void or correct that, that logical misperception of where things were heading. So, 24 became 12, became five, five. That's it. That's all the NFL looked at, five. And if in none of those five, you have any evidence of violence, coercion, threat, duress, nothing that would trigger the six game baseline suspension subject to mitigation or aggravation and obviously the aggravating factors would be here hey there's 24 of these claims in all we need to do more than six but if you never get to the point where six is on the table where are you where are you at that point at that point your best argument if you're the league is that well we've got a guy who had a habit slash fetish frankly let's call it what it is of getting massages, and trying to make those massages into sexual encounters. And even though we've been unable to prove that there was anything that rose to the level of assault under the personal conduct policy, the mere fact that he was going around person to person using social media to arrange these sessions and hoping that most, if not all of them, would become a sexual encounter That's the kind of behavior that undermines the integrity of the NFL. That's the kind of thing that requires an intervention. You know, at the end of the day, it's kind of what they did to Ben Roethlisberger. They didn't have any proof of assault. So they looked at the behavior that gave rise to the allegations. Said you're engaging in conduct that puts you in the position where you're going to face these kinds of accusations. You're involved in human interactions that logically lead to someone having a problem with how you're acting. So that would be the argument. Well, you know, we can't prove an actual assault. Sorry, we tried. We tried. Didn't work. But this man must be punished because he has engaged in behavior that undermines the integrity of the NFL, its teams, et cetera. That's when this issue of proportionality comes into play. Robert Kraft, owner of the Patriots, very different case. No accusation of any wrongdoing, no NDAs, no lawsuits. Kraft was charged with solicitation. The charges eventually were thrown out because of gross overreach by authorities in secretly recording these sessions, secretly recording people who were going in just for massages, massage only, not massage plus, massage period. They were being recorded. Horrible, horrible violation of privacy rights. That was the centerpiece of Robert Kraft's defense, and the case was dismissed. But he was still charged with solicitation, with a massage becoming something more than a massage. And as we reported last night, the league acknowledged that its security department investigated the Kraft situation, and ultimately Kraft was not punished. So if, if the investigation resulted in the conclusion that one of the owners of the 32 NFL teams got a massage that became a sexual encounter and he wasn't disciplined 
for conduct that undermines the league, its teams, et cetera, or puts people at risk. It's just, hey, this is the kind of behavior that's only going to lead to trouble for the shield. We better punish anyone who engages in this kind of behavior. If you didn't punish Kraft for it, and the policy says owners are held to a higher standard, how do you punish Watson? How do you do it? That's really the bottom line here. And this is a benefit of the clarity that has emerged from the process and what we've reported on what happened during the proceedings. Now, I still fault Watson's camp for trying to attack with a sledgehammer and not a scalpel. Because someone, whether it's Rusty Harden, David Mulligetta, or someone else, someone should have been talking to someone in the media and explaining in very logical, simple terms. Here's what's going to happen at this hearing. They're going to try to prove that there was assault. They're not going to be able to prove it. There's no allegation. There's no proof of violence or threats of violence. They're not going to be able to trigger the six game baseline suspension. So then they're going to fall back to, well, we can't have a guy going out and getting massage after massage after massage and hoping it becomes a sexual encounter when they have an owner who they didn't discipline for allegedly having a massage that became a sexual encounter. And my, my assumption is the investigation that was done by the league came to the conclusion that, yeah, that's what happened. Massage became a sexual encounter. If you don't discipline Robert Kraft in any way, how do you discipline Deshaun Watson? Do you say, well, Kraft did it once. Watson did it a bunch of times. Did they introduce evidence of Watson doing it a bunch of times? They folks, did, did they introduce evidence of 66 at least or 100 or more? All of the inflammatory things that Tony Busby has put out there or the things that have been reported? If all they have is five, that potentially didn't even become sexual encounters. That's the other side of it, too. If they focused all their eggs on the basket of five people who were offended by his behavior during massage therapy sessions that didn't even become sexual encounters, how do you even discipline him for massages that became sexual encounters? See, we know a lot of stuff as members of the court of public opinion. All that matters for Judge Robinson is the evidence that was introduced Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I'm not gonna be surprised if he's not suspended at all. I'm not. And again, it's sad and unfortunate that there wasn't a better effort to push back against the Tony Busby media offensive because it's too late to put the horse back in the barn. And one of the problems they're going to have, if Judge Robinson imposes little or no punishment at all on Deshaun Watson, the problem they have is people are going to lose their minds. People who have only been following this at a very casual distance, they hear 24 allegations. They see bits and pieces of the Ashley Solis interview with HBO's Real Sports or this or that or whatever. They have an expectation in mind that at the end of the day, the NFL, hey, Roger Goodell, he's the enforcer. He's going to take care of this situation. Remember, Roger Goodell is never going to be accused of being too lenient on anyone after the Ray Rice case nearly brought him down. Well, with Sean Watson... It's not Roger Goodell's decision. See, this new procedure, which gives players some voice of independence that makes the decision before it gets appealed to Roger Goodell, if it even gets appealed there, 
the league can say we didn't make this decision. Now, the league may have blown the case. The league may have done a better job. It could have done a better job of producing evidence that would have gotten what the league wants. I mean, it is going to be kind of weird for the league to say, well, we wanted a minimum suspension of a year. Well, what's your evidence? Here's our evidence. Well, why the hell did you want a one-year suspension based on that? And that's going to be one of the things I look at very carefully in the final decision we get from Judge Robinson. What did the league introduce and why would the league have thought a one-year suspension was justified based upon the evidence it introduced? And maybe the league just kind of threw the fight. Maybe the league knew. Maybe the league knew at the end of the day it really didn't have anything, but it had to puff its chest out and demand a one-year suspension so no one would say the commissioner was being too, too soft on Deshaun Watson. But we'll find out. That's where this goes will have a written ruling that will be released, that will be available, there will be transparency. We'll all have it. I will read it word for word when it comes out and I will make notes and I will either be sitting here or upstairs in the PFT Live studio and I'll explain everything that I glean from it. What does this mean? How did we get here? What does this mean for Deshaun Watson or others? What kind of precedent has been set here? Is it persuasive? Are there flaws? And Judge Robinson needs to have a bulletproof opinion in writing that makes it understandable why she's doing what she's doing. And it needs to be understandable, not just for the lawyers in the crowd. It needs to be something that is understandable by the average person who may be inclined to read it. Now, most people aren't going to read it. But in the event that the average person is curious and wants to see, well, why, why did he get far less of a suspension than the league wanted? Why wasn't he punished at all? Let me go read this and see. You don't want that person to shut down on page one. There's a lot of gobbledygook and legalese that gets into these things. It needs to be clean. It needs to be understandable. It needs to engage the reader from the first, not just paragraph, but from the first word. You don't need some, some legal term to start it all off and the person just shuts down and says i'm not even going to try to decipher this thing it needs to be cleared it needs to be understandable and it needs to make the case it needs to build the wall one brick at a time as to why judge robinson decided what she decided and you know to the extent that there is going to be a media offensive and i wrote something about that today at pft that maybe next week we're going to start seeing a more aggressive effort by watson's camp to push back against the four remaining cases 20 of them are now officially settled to the extent that that happens, it's useful to Watson, to the Browns, to the league, to the union, and to Judge Robinson, because we're now in the range where the expectations need to be properly set as to what's coming. And if a suspension far less than what the NFL wanted, and possibly no suspension at all, if that's what's coming based upon the quality of the evidence the NFL brought forward, people need to be ready for it. Because if that ruling comes out, and what you do when you get this long ruling, the first thing you do is you go to the last page and see what the decision is. It's a final line will say what it is. That's what everybody will do. Once people see that, if it is less than what the league wanted, far less than what the league wanted, if it's no suspension at all, no violation of the personal conduct policy, there's going to be some people wondering what the hell happened. Now, again, Roger Goodell's got some buffer here. He's got some protection. He's not the one making the decision. It's Judge Sue L. Robinson, jointly hired, jointly compensated by the League and the Union. He's got protection. And if she finds no discipline whatsoever, there isn't a damn thing he can do about it. See, it gets awkward if she would find one game, two games, four games a fine, whatever, any discipline. And the league then has to decide, do we appeal it? But even if they appeal it, they are bound by the facts as determined by Judge Robinson. They can't disagree with her facts. They can't say, well, we respect what she said, but we think something else happened. We think that things she didn't take into account are relevant to the decision on appeal. No, the appeal is driven by the facts as determined by Judge Robinson. So even though Roger Goodell still has final say, his hands are going to be tied if Judge Robinson writes the opinion the correct way and 25 years on a federal bench tells me that maybe she will, she's going to paint him into a corner 
and he's not going to be able to do much more. And maybe that's why they were putting out the word earlier this week that maybe they won't appeal. Maybe they're starting to realize that this new procedure may not be quite as favorable to the league as they thought, may not give them that last chance to do whatever they want to do, and they may have to accept these rulings, whatever they may be. And it would have made more sense then to just let someone else handle the appeal. I think having the commissioner have the appeal is that that one last safety valve that the league has for a case when for whatever reason it really wants to make sure a guy gets more by way of suspension than the independent process would give him. So that's where we are. Keep an eye on July 25. That's two weeks or so after she gets the briefs. It gives her enough time to write a lengthy opinion, think about it, make sure it looks good, revise it, revise it, revise it, revise it. Don't create the appearance it was rushed. Two weeks is just about enough time. You know, she may have other stuff going on too in her law practice that she can't just throw out the window. So I think between the 25th and the end of that week, we'll get something. And we'll be back from hiatus by then. So we'll be ready to react to whatever the decision may be and what it all means. And that disconnect, bridging that gap between court of public opinion and the court of the shield. In the court of the shield, things may go much better for Deshaun Watson than they have gone in the court of public opinion or may go in civil court. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.